everyone. Uh, welcome to the Board of Directors regular meeting. Uh, today is Thursday, August 27th. Uh, this meeting is being held remotely via Zoom. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, Ms. Pania, can you please call the roll? Yes, Director Orzali. Here. Thank you, Director Wood. Here. Director Kelly. Present. Director Sailors. Here. Director Clark. Present. Director Jones. Present. Director White. Here. Director Sheets. Present. And another chance for Director Gould. Have you joined us by chance? I have a text into him, so I will let you know if he joins. Um, roll calls <laughs> over, turning it back over to you, President Sheets. Thank you. Uh, this is Metro Cable announcement. The open session meeting is videotaped for cable cast on Metro Cable 14. Replay on Sunday, August 30th at 2 p.m. and Monday, August 31st at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. Webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. This is now the public's opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within the district's jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Madam Clerk, are there any speakers? Nobody reached out to me beforehand, but Art, if you could please unmute everyone and give those attendees a chance to speak if they wish. Yep, working on it. Okay, attendees, you have the option to unmute yourselves and speak at this moment. Looks like no response. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the consent items, are there any questions or concerns from the board members regarding the consent items? Madam Chair, I'd move the consent. Okay. okay we have a person and second. Can you please call the roll? Director Orzali. Aye. Wood. Here. Yeah, aye. Kelly. Aye. Sailors. Aye. Clark. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. One more time for Director White. Aye. Mute was on. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. And Director Sheets? Aye. Motion passes. All right. There are two presentation items. The first presentation item. Uh, Ms. Christiana Fields uh, regarding the Community Risk Reduction Division update. Good evening, directors, uh, Chief Harms, executive staff. Uh, Christiana Fields here with CRRD, Deputy Fire Marshal, here to give you a quick update on what's happening in the Community Risk Reduction Division. Um, so at the beginning of uh, COVID-19, most of our businesses were closed with the shelter in place orders. Uh, so between um, the middle of March to beginning of June, we were unable to complete any code enforcement inspections um, other than immediate life safety concerns or complaints that came in. We did at that time start to see an increase in false alarms and complaints about systems out of service as systems were, were no longer being monitored or man maintained by businesses that were experiencing economic hardship. Um, during that same time period, since we were unable to do inspections, we had some of our inspectors working in other areas of the district. Uh, we had some of our new inspectors working um, with Chief Law and EMS, some of our new inspectors working to obtain and distribute pandemic supplies and logistics. Um, but as of June the 1st, we are back to resuming all of our code enforcement inspections, with the exception of our um, elderly care facilities, the large and small, uh, due to the <laughs> entry and um, exposure risks there. Um, our code, inf code enforcement inspectors, you'll see them in the field Monday through Friday. Uh, they'll be completing our state mandated inspections, including the 2020 engine company inspections that we transferred from the engine company this year back to CRRD to complete. 
Um, with that time period between March and June that we are unable to do inspections, we are about 30% behind in our state mandated inspections, but we do expect to have them completed by December the 1st, and we'll have a full update for you in our October presentation. On the new construction side, um, new construction has been moving throughout the COVID pandemic. Um, our new constructors are rotating, new construction inspectors, excuse me, are rotating their time half in the field doing inspections and then half at home doing their plan and plan reviews. Um, plan review this year started a little bit higher and then kind of uh, went down a little bit as COVID started, but it's begun to pick back up. So overall through July, we saw about a 2% reduction in our plan submittals. Um, as far as the construction inspections, as that initial increase was in the beginning of the year, we've had an increase in our construction inspections about 12%, so that was expected. Over in the community services side, our community services personnel are also rotating half in the office, half working from home. Uh, they just finished their preparation of our virtual Milo and Moxie program. And this is the educational program we have that teaches kids about safety around things that are hot. Uh, this virtual program is going to include live presentations from our community services personnel, as well as pre-recorded videos with our fire crews doing turnout demos, as well as engine um, tours that they would normally get from training in person. Um, our goal with this program is to reach up to 10,000 um, children by spring of next year. Um, our community service personnel are also working on converting other uh, community safety programming from in-person to virtual. And they've completed the update of our after the fire brochure, which includes new um, next steps, tips, and important contact information for those who have experienced a fire. And then our weed abatement side, we're still in grass season. Uh, similar to last year, we sent out uh, vegetation clearance informational flyers in April. Um, just to any other parcels that had notices last year, we sent those out in April, started our program and sent official notices May the 1st. We sent out almost 400 notices and to date we've had 100% compliance. So all of those that we have noticed have cleared their lots, um, except for the 17 lots that are currently in process. But this is our at least the first year that I've seen recently that we've gotten 100% compliance um, this early in the season. Um, that is, concludes my report. Um, if there are any questions, I'm willing to answer any of those. Thank you, Ms. Fields. Are there any questions or comments? Um, Madam President, this is uh, Director Jones. And uh, I would like to thank the CR CRRD for um, modifying our outreach to schools with this, uh, all the video and the zooming and the uh, uh, challenges that have presented themselves to all of us in in this present time of COVID. So thank you so much for continuing to reach out to all the schools and continue this really, really important educational work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Any other comments? Thank you, Ms. Fields. There's no action required, so we'll move on to the second presentation item. Uh, Station 68 construction update, Mr. Jeffrey, Economic Development Manager. Uh, thank you, President Sheets, and good afternoon, or evening, Directors, uh, Chief Harms. Uh, it's been quite some time since we've given you an update on 68 or taking anything to the board relating to the project. So we thought it was a really good time um, to bring you up today, and I, I really have four goals for the presentation. I wanna provide you an update on the work that has been completed to date since our uh, last update, discuss some project challenges uh, that have materialized with the project, uh, complete a high level design review with the board, and then go over a few next steps. Um, so jumping right into the presentation, um, we, as the board is aware, uh, we are authorized to enter an agreement with the city of uh, Rancho Cordova to accomplish the land exchange in 2019, which uh, allowed us to swap the property that we had that had some uh, response limitations uh, for a site that gave us a little bit of um, a better run time um, to a substantial part of the new development in Rancho Cordova. Um, the site we exchanged is in front of you, and I'm going to outline um, the original parcel shape here. It was this odd shape parcel at um, a corner of Douglas and Cobblebrook. Um, we asked MFDB um, early in the process, as soon as we had acquired the site, 
to do a quick conceptual layout. Um, we asked for three of them to see how a station would fit. Uh, one okay. second, Jeff. Sorry for. Uh, are you screen sharing at the moment? We are not seeing anything. On Thank you for that. Let me. Let me see if I can. How's that? It's coming up. And there we go. Yep, we see it. So as I was saying, the uh, this is the site we originally acquired here. Um, it's a little bit odd shaped. Um, we asked the architect at the time to uh, conceptually fit a station on there. And it was just an awkward layout. And it left uh, major areas of the, the lot undeveloped and unusable. So we had gone back uh, to the adjacent landowners here and asked to acquire a little more, more land on the back side of the property um, so that we can develop the uh, station to our typical prototype. Um, and what we ended up doing is a larger swap of land and we traded what we call this remainder here uh, for this additional land that's white hats to the back of our station square foot for square foot. Um, it gave us a lot more extra room in the back. It'll be useful for properties down or for operations down the road. And then got rid of this awkward corner that really isn't usable for us in the fire service, but it's a great location for retail. Um, so really this was a win-win, um, really minimal cost to the district, just the cost to do the, the paperwork and record um, the new um, site and it was finalized in April of 2020. So that was a big win for us. Um, it did delay our project about three months, but considering this is the permanent home for Station 68, we thought it made a lot of sense. Um, so I'm going to show you, um, this is from the county's uh, parcel viewer, and you can see the site here, it does exist. Um, again, using the laser, uh, this is Douglas Boulevard here, and this is the new Rancho Cordova Parkway, and then we're going to be on Cobblebrook, just about 400 feet off the corner there. Um, gives us really good uh, north-south response from Douglas Boulevard all the way to Kiefer, and then of course Douglas Boulevard runs all the way out to Grant Line, and then west uh, back across the canal. So it really is a great site for us. Um, as you can see, there is no civil work here. This is a true greenfield site, which uh, provides some of its own challenges and I'll go into in a bit. Um, so now we're just going to jump into the design process. Um, I have our goals there as a reminder. Uh, we introduced these when we went out for bid for the architect and engineering firm. Um, and again, a reminder, our team is MFDB architects. Um, who is responsible for the design. And Roblin, um, we have retained Roblin services last year. And there's two parts of their contract. They're doing a constructability review, and we really relied on them to help us with this. And then um, they were going to manage the construction process once construction started. So uh, we had three major check-ins check during the uh, review, design review process. Um, the first one came at 35%, and we had formed a small design review committee. Um, Chief Shannon was the lead and the executive team liaison. Captain uh, Jeff Malinowski was what I call the end user perspective, but he represented the line and the folks that live in the stations every day. And then Aaron Caspel was our project coordinator and did a lot of uh, liaison work with our subject matter experts, uh, particularly um, in support services. Um, so that was our small committee. As we had questions, we'd run it out to everybody through that group. And what's important to note here is with the 35%, we asked for a cost estimate um, from a well-known cost estimator here in Sacramento, but we also asked Roblin to do a separate uh, uh, cost estimation, and we compared the two. And the project at that time came in between 12 and $15 million dollars um, which was a very big concern for us because when we had done our preliminary homework, um, we thought the station cost would be between seven and a half, maybe up to eight and a half million dollars. 
and that was consistent with the station Folsom, Roseville, and Sacramento had recently built in 2016-17. Um, so we've really seen costs, construction costs skyrocket in Sacramento in the last few years. Um, it was a major effort. Um, we had taken this cost to uh, the executive staff and we had established uh, a new budget of about $9 million. And uh, we really took on a major effort to reduce the project cost to get us more in line with $9 million. Um, so uh, that was quite an effort and it took us a few weeks to identify all the cost savings and then uh, direct the uh, the design team accordingly and again put us we lost probably two to three weeks for the project overhaul uh, because of that at 65 percent review we um, expedited it we basically kept the review to just the design review committee and Roblin for constructability um, but at that time we did take the design to the city of Rancho Cordova um, which has to approve it um, for envir environmental purposes and a, and a host of other things. Um, the design was re received by the city and um, approved, and we moved on full throttle to 95%, which is where we find ourselves today. So at 95%, again, it's almost a complete design, so I always like to get as many eyes on the design as possible um, and get as much feedback um, and specifications as we can to ensure a great project. Um, so with that in mind, we have, we did a white paper um, and put it uh, out to the membership and with a little background of where we are and where we're going. We've taken it back to our subject matter experts for a technical review. We did include CRD in that uh, to get a jump on plan check. Um, we have done a walkthrough with the executive team and VP McGoldrick and now, uh, here shortly, I will go through the design with the board as well. We do expect in a week or so a new cost estimate, um, eagerly awaiting to see what that is, and that will let us know if we need to make any more adjustments to the uh, design. So I do want to fill you in what we've done to reduce the project costs as much as possible. Um, we did focus on three areas. The first is called value engineering. It's basically a reduction in size and square footage of the facility or quality, if you will. Um, we did find about $1.8 million reduction by reducing the front apron and uh, some of the square footage related to future growth. Again, that was one of the goals is to be ready for future growth. Um, it's just not in the budget at this point in time. Um, so it's something that we will have to consider down the road, but uh, I have 1.8 million dollars here I think it's closer to two um, as we uh, Finish up the design the next piece is the construction management And this is where I do want to focus a little bit because it will require an action item from the board following this presentation and in, in conversations with Robo and, and how to meet our budget costs um, they have recommended in uh, a strategy to reduce costs um, and basically we're going to change how we manage the project. Before we were asking for a construction management at risk in which Roblin would effectively guarantee the project and the delivery and then directly manage um, multiple general contractors. Um, and while it's great uh, for us in government, it provides a lot of checks and balances. Um, it's an expensive way to do business. Um, it creates a lot of overhead costs uh, that ripple down and through the project. So by amending the contract to just a construction management, in essence, Roblin will be a consultant to us through the project. Um, Metro Fire will hold the contract directly and, and, and the general contractor will essentially report to us, we expect that we can save at least $700,000 on the project. And then finally, project delivery, I do wanna to bring to your attention, in the original cost estimate, the, uh, the group noted what I call market volatility, but the idea is they expect it to be between 13 and $15 million, but that cost could be adjusted upward by 40% or downward by 20%, 
based on the response to our bid. So Roblin again had helped us by um, suggesting uh, moving away from a multiple prime bid to a single contractor, which we think will generate more interest in the project, thereby pushing the potential bids down um, eight to ten percent at least. And I think recently uh, they had bid an airport fire station uh, here in Sacramento International. And I believe that station came in about 12% our estimated costs. So um, we're really hoping for that savings to deliver this project. Um, but at this point in time, those savings are unknown. So changing gears here, I do want to move to a design review and I'll start with the site plan. Um, I will start here at the front of the station. I do want to remind you that this is um, what we submitted with the city design review. So this is still based on the old design before we had gone through those drastic reductions to bring the project in line. Um, so the station that you see in front of you is a three bay 11,000 square foot station. In fact, it will be a two bay 9,000 square foot station. Um, one of the cost saving measures I mentioned was reducing the ramp size. Um, this ramp is capable of accommodating a truck without pulling out into the sidewalk space there. We have reduced that down to accommodate an engine on the front and we pulled the entire station and the site forward, I think around 50 feet, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that is a uh, significant savings to the project. So moving along to the side here, a typical entrance for us. Um, there is some public parking here in the front to a concrete path that leads up to the building. The um, rolling gate, secure gate is here as, as indicated in the plan, uh, which brings us to the back of the station. Um, I will point out the turning radius here is capable of accommodating the truck. Um, so we still have that capability. Um, there is a fair amount of extra space on the back of the lot now with the changes we have made. Uh, so we had notified operations that there may be some room back here for them to think about how they'd like to use it. The initial idea was um, a gravel area for additional storage. Um, now the space is actually bigger because we have moved the station forward. So I think operations continues to think about how that will be treated. And uh, this space is available for future use. And then I will bring your attention over here into the corner where we have a essentially a four bay and open fifth bay metal storage building for this uh, additional apparatus. It gives us a lot of flexibility operationally to store off season vehicles or um, in service reserve vehicles. Three of the bays will be reserved for the apparatus. The fourth will be a tool room. And this open area, um, I'm gonna grab my laser pointer here. This open area here is the truck wash. Um, so that will allow us to keep uh, the reserve apparatus out of the apparatus base and, and leave those for active um, apparatus, ideally. Um, so I will stop there and ask if there are any questions about the site plan. Questions come? This is Director White. Um, you know, I'm really glad to see the the value engineering, and but I was it was nice to to hear the addition of the uh, additional apparatus storage because you know going from three to two, where we really or we anticipated growth of the district and and service of that station. Do we feel that you know that makes us at least a 25 year plus station or um do you see operationally us needing to add equipment at that location sooner than that i i see us based on the growth in the area and projected call volume i don't think we would need the extra apparatus for at least 40 years and we would need to be well into the end of build out of all the projects um so that's at least 40 years it could be 50. So I think when we gave uh, Chief Harm and the executive team that information, 
they felt it was a, a good way to move forward with reducing it to the two bay. Thank you. That was the only question I had. Any other questions from the uh, directors? Yes, if I could, please. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Kelly. Um, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Mr. Fry if uh, the fact that now that uh, Roblin is acting as a construction manager, no longer a CM at risk, does that permit them to do self-performing work on the project? No, it actually, um, under the at risk, they could have done um, self-performance if no one had bid the project. Um, as a, just a construction manager, um, we will stipulate in the contract that they are not allowed to. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Okay. Hearing back to you, Mr. Fry. Moving on to the floor plan, um, it is a fairly familiar design to all of us. Uh, so I will go through it. If, if you've been through any of our newer stations, it's, it's very similar. Um, I will note the secure lobby here off the front of the station is designed to be to meet the safe place standards. Um, all the frontage glass and the glass of the admin space and the view panel uh, to the corridor is all bulletproof glass. We did remove the transaction panes from the glass of the admin space. And then there will be a, what we call a red phone to the captain's quarters. Um, again, the admin space is very similar to what you've seen in our newest stations um, with the built-in desktops all the way around and there will be some upper cabinetry for binders and such. Um, off the front of the corridor is the ADA restroom along with the captain's quarter and uh, the bathroom for the captain. Heading north, uh, again, a very typical uh, configuration for an open day room and kitchen. Um, there is access from the captain's quarters and the kitchen and the dorms to this, what will be an enclosed uh, patio, it'll be a landscape courtyard with a pony concrete wall with landscape inside. Uh, should be very relaxing space. And then moving towards the back where the dorms will be, um, we did keep the essentially the fifth dorm, which allows to accommodate either um, a training firefighter or probation firefighter or convert this to truck operations if it is needed in the future. Um, so we do have, you know, that flexibility. Uh, industry standard for bathrooms now is uh, two dorm rooms to a shower. So uh, by that configuration, we do have an extra uh, shower, which will be an ADA shower up in the, the uh, top right hand corner. And I will now move to the apparatus bay. Uh, two bay double deep. I will note that we are desperately trying to hang on to the bifold doors here. Um, we do think there's, it's a big upfront cost, but there's an advantage in uh, maintenance costs and then operationally. Um, to keep in the bifold doors, they're easier to operate in power shutoffs um, or if they're mechanically broken. Um, you can literally move them with two fingers. Uh, so keeping with our theme of um, operational performance, that is a, an aspect of the project we are trying to keep. Um, moving over uh, to the uh, business side of the station, if you will. This is a typical, again, a typical configuration um, for tool room, radio, fire, electrical, janitorial. Um, at the turnout room, industry standard is two lockers for every firefighter per shift. Um, we do have four extra lockers over that requirement. And I am gonna take a second here to note the vestibule that you see here in the middle of your screen. Um, that is a, uh, a firefighter safety measure to keep the contaminants out of the residential space. Um, it is positive pressure back into the apparatus bay. Um, so we have talked about this in the past and keeping the carcinogens out of the station. Uh, this is a move in that direction and uh, we're excited about that. There are three vestibules. Um, from the apparatus bay to each side of, uh, I'm sorry, one on this side and two on the other side. And then finally, a larger fitness room. 
um, to allow for more functional training with an overhead door. We do have a substantial outdoor fitness patio, which will allow firefighters to roll up uh, the overhead door and train indoors and outdoors. So with that, I will also pause once more and ask for any questions about the floor. Any questions from the directors? Uh, yes, Madam President, this is Gay. And uh, Jeff, looks, this looks terrific. Uh, we'll, I, I would request that you send copies of this oh, yeah, via email yeah. or whatever to each of our directors so we can kind of muse about it and, and, and look it over uh, a, 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 with a, a set of additional eyes. Uh, it looks great here on the front. I would just like to have a, a little bit more time to, uh, to take a look at it. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Are there Director any other? White. Yeah, okay, go just one comment and one question. I'm glad to see you sticking with the, the bifold rather than the overhead doors. I completely agree on the, the maintenance side of things. However, we did have a, a one injury at a city station based on a pinch point uh, with those doors. So as long as they're engineered to avoid that, that sounds great. But uh, you know, I, it's at least a silver lead rated, or did you achieve a higher lead rating than that with the, uh, the We're We're not pursuing it. They are designing to a lot of those standards. However, the cost associated with getting the, the lead rating is an additional cost. Um, so at this point in time, while it is a part of the design, we are not pursuing the, the designation. Okay. Not pursuing the designation, but is there a, um, you know, kind of a projection on, on what lead rating it would receive? I, let me ask the architects and I'll, I'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. And to your question about the bollards, we did have a, a lot of conversations with the city's team, uh, or I'm sorry, with the bifold doors. The issue was with a bollard and where it was placed in location to the uh, opening of the door. And we have sent that information on to our design team to make sure they address it in the design. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I'm very familiar with that bollard issue. So thank you. Right, any other questions? Right back to you, Mr. Fry. Okay, so finally, I just wanted to show you some of the elevations. Um, and I will start up here with the front elevation. Um, we are looking at a mid-century modern design uh, with a more of a commercial appeal than residential. Uh, that was done purposely. We will be in a neighborhood retail center um, behind us and to the right. Um, so this is an O to that, if you will. Um, we also know that there are a number of elevations in the, in the uh, residential neighborhoods to the south. Um, that also have a modern uh, elevation, one of three. Um, so we're excited about the aesthetic here. Um, it is certainly unique. Um, and we really do think it'll go a long way uh, to add to the character of the neighborhood and the community. Uh, there's no doubt it is a fire station. And, um, you know, we think it's a, a good fit for how the uh, community ultimately uh, built out. So this is the front elevation. I will move to the back elevation. And what I will point out here is the roll-up door um, that you can see that goes into the fitness room. I would also note that there is a complete covered walkway from the dorms across the back of the apron to the fitness room, all covered. Uh, we did that uh, so uh, the members can avoid walking through the apparatus room to get to the uh, fitness room and the other side. Um, so hopefully that will help uh, reduce um, contamination. And there is, it's not reflected in this, uh, but there is a decon shower um, that will be right off the uh, dorm side um, if we're coming back from a response and need a shower before entering the space. Um, and then I will slide to the bottom. And this is uh, an aerial, and you can see uh, looking down on the site with the different roofline elevations, with the courtyard, and then how it fits on the site. And then finally, I will end 
uh, here, this is from the BC corner, um, standing out in the driveway, looking back at the station, just another uh, a view for you. So- I have one that, question if I may. Oh. Please. Um, Jeff, I was just wondering, uh, looking at those roof elevations and so forth, um, is there any idea of uh, solar for the project at all? There is. Um, I can't promise it'll stay because of the extreme uh, budget constraints we're under, um, but there was a small uh, panel proposed um, for at least uh, some of the, um, the electrical functioning. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, this is Director Sailors. I have a question. Go ahead, Ms. Sailors. Um, is there a generator designed for backup power? Yes. Um, I will go back a few slides here. It's hidden in the trees. Okay. But I, I'll, it's back here with the uh, fuel dispenser with trash enclosure. There's a generator here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So moving on, uh, next few months will be very busy. Um, we hope to finalize the design by September. We will implement all the comments from the 95% review and then work on selecting the final finishes for the project. Uh, at the end of September, we intend to start the permit application process with the city and also be working on the bid release and uh, bid award. Uh, just a reminder that the a uh, bit award will have to come back to the board for approval. Um, and then at that point in time, the market volatility that I was describing before will be known. We'll know the cost of the station. And ultimately that'll be lead to a go or no go decision uh, with the chief and the, the uh, board of directors. Uh, in the meantime, we will also be coordinating all the civil work that's going on um, in the area for the residential units to the south. Um, that is com uh, estimated to be completed by December, and our intent at this point in time is to start our project in December. So we will be very closely walking or watching all of that work and coordinating um, with our project. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, so I will ask for any final questions or comments. Uh, one final comment for Director Kelly. Uh, Jeff, uh, from somebody that knows what it takes to bring a project just to this point, I appreciate your hard work and uh, the efforts that you've put into this. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I'd just like to add, Jeff, thanks for all the work you've done. It's a wonderful job and the facility looks great and I'm sure our members will be very happy to get out of the, uh, the tent and the little house over in Anatolia now. So thank you for all you've done. Any other this questions is, or comments? Well, this is Director White. I appreciate all the work that the team's put into this project as well. So um, just add $2 million to your projected costs, and you'll probably be close to it. So thanks. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Director Clark. Um, Jeff, uh, I also, I mean, it's been said already, but I, that's an excellent job. Great presentation. Um, really appreciate your hard work. Very, very good presentation. Thank you. This is Director Sailors. Um, Jeff, I would like to say I think this is an awesome presentation and a wonderful package you've put together. I'm looking forward to receiving this package and looking at it closer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Jeff. This was a great presentation. Thank you. All right, moving on to the action item amendment to the agreement, the Roblin Construction Management. Mr. Fry, you are up. So um, what's nice about doing the presentation and following with the action item is you're all kind of up to speed. Um, so as you are aware, we do need to adjust the agreement with Roblin to meet our budget. Um, there's really two parts to that agreement with Roblin. One was for pre-construction services, which They've done a fantastic job and truly partnered with us to deliver the project. But secondly is the, um, the during construction management aspect of this. 
we do need to change it. Um, they're partnering with us, even though it's less money for them. Um, they know the importance of this station and they are excited about the project. Um, the construction manager they've already selected has direct experience with our previous three stations and really is a wealth of knowledge. She's already pointed out a lot of um, potential roadblocks for the construction progress and we're, and we're already working on those. So uh, with that, I'll keep it short and uh, ask the board uh, to approve the staff recommendation to amend the contract with Roblin so we can keep this project on track. Madam Chair, I'd like to make that motion that we approve staff recommendation. I'd like I second that. that. Perfect. Yep. First and a second and a third. <laughs> Can you please call the roll? All right. Director Rosali. Aye. Wood. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Sailors. Aye. Clark. Aye. Jones. Aye. White. Aye. All right, and I have word that Director Gould has joined us and has been unmuted. Director Gould, are you in a position to vote on this? Hey, Melissa, just letting you know, I'm, I have the option to unmute him and I'm clicking it, but it's not going through on my end, or at least it's not automatically unmuting him. So I don't know if Zoom changed any since anything since then. So, uh, Director Gold, if you can hear, do you have an option on the phone to unmute yourself? If there is, hopefully you can try it. Okay. We are not at a risk of not having this motion passed. So the final voter will be Director Sheets. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, Directors. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sorry. Okay. Really bad connection tonight. No problem. All right. Uh, moving on to reports, President's report. I have nothing to report. Uh, so we'll move on to the fire chief's report, Chief Harms. Good evening, directors. It's been a busy two weeks. Uh, I guess we just decided to add a hurricane as a category four because there wasn't <laughs> enough that was going on. Um, Task Force 7 from Sacramento originally was dispatched and Metro was a part of a type one deployment that had 80 folks between the region. Uh, unfortunately, they were canceled. And so we'll find out more about that later on. Uh, it's been a busy two weeks. Uh, we had a couple of meetings with labor this uh, past two weeks, myself and Vice President McGoldrick uh, did a video for the membership and talked about staffing. Uh, we talked about our deployments and uh, where we were at kind of overall as an agency. We also had our uh, labor management meeting. We talked about the hazmat contract. Again, a lot about staffing, some positions within the organization, some single resources, uh, and where we are as far as putting those out and just making sure we keep those discussions open. Uh, also on the 20th of this month, it was the county fire chiefs. Uh, it's kind of the uh, executive group, which are the fire chiefs and the ops chiefs at our meeting. Uh, we talked about where dispatch is. Uh, Chief uh, Tyler Wagaman gave us an update on some of the improvements that have been done over there. Uh, they started another training class of dispatchers uh, and also where our original, just this other class of dispatchers are at. Uh, I talked about Cal Chiefs, EMS, and operations. Um, also this week, uh, I received from Jeff Wells an update on our EAP, uh, our system, uh, the usage of our system. We had a few calls that were activated as far as support mechanisms for the crews that were out there. Um, Jeff gave us an update just this week on Station 68, much similar to the update that you have. Um, you know, Jeff, Aaron, Chief Shannon, they've all done just a great job of pulling everything together. Um, but Jeff did a, you know, a great job of going outside and, and seeking input in from other folks. 
some of the questions that we had and he had kind of informed us was that last 5% really is what are the countertops, what are the cabinets, what are some of the finishes with inside the station and he is pulling that together and Jeff thanks for the presentation tonight and the detail that you did on there. Uh, also I want to thank Krishana and everybody over in CRRD. Uh, as you can see, you know, I think in the beginning we didn't really know how to adapt. Uh, we did a really good job of moving people around to help support the organization. Um, but they really have both, um, uh, everybody in CRD have adapted to what can we do today and where can we go to and, and how do we complete our inspections to continue to move forward. Uh, one of the things that I, I believe we'll get a lot of input on uh, is our community involvement or, or the community group and outreach uh, back to the schools and, and being able to adapt to be able to do that. So a lot of good things that are happening there on that side. Um, I had the opportunity and was invited to participate. To, today was the first day and it was called the Urban Fire Forum. And typically in the past before COVID, a uh, very small group of people uh, were picked and they would go, usually it's in Boston, and meet for three or four days and talk about topics in the fire service. Um, they've adapted the urban fire form now to where it's over the, it's once a month for the next six months. And today we heard from the uh, president and CEO of the NFPA, Jim Pauley, and talked about the NFPA codes, the cycles, how things are being uh, adapted to today's time, on the delivering of that, and then just kind of a general overview of NFPA and where they're at. Uh, and then also a, a gentleman named Keith Bryant. And if you remember a few of you the last couple of years at Cap to Cap, we had the opportunity to go over and see Keith. He is the US Fire Administrator. And um, he uh, kind of went over what was happening across the region, what bills are moving forward, what's happening at the National Fire Academy. So it was, um, one, nice to be invited, but two, it's, it's nice that so many additional people can be involved and really hear what's happening across the state and what is going on. Um, the last thing that I have is just, it's been a really busy week with EMS. Uh, I've given a lot, we have given a lot of updates to you all. Uh, we have definitely some legislation here in the last uh, few hours of the session. Uh, the governor will sign the budget on Monday and we are doing a hard push for moving things forward. We also still have our local and at a state level approach to going through some of our EMS challenges that we're having. A busy two weeks, kind of wrapped up right there. Um, that ends my report, unless you have any questions. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the chief? Thank you, sir. All right, moving on to the operations report, uh, Deputy Chief Bridge. Good evening, President Sheets and directors. I'll be brief with my report. Uh, it has been very busy. Um, our call volume has been, uh, has returned to its normal call volume. As we see, it's ebbs and flows, um, ranging anywhere from 230 calls a day up over 320 calls a day, settling on an average around 265 to 275 calls a day. And uh, for perspective, stations 24 and stations 53 continue to be battling it out for one and two. That's um, staying and holding consistent, running about on average about 14 calls a day. Um, on the upside of things, on the staffing front, we are uh, at one of our better staffing positions. And keep in mind that I could change it on the hour. But as we sit today and over the last few days, our, no our staffing numbers have improved quite a bit. Um, since we moved to a different strategy in terms of how we're testing our folks. Uh, with that, currently um, that and also that they're uh, using a new tool, an EMS tool, screening tool, to um, uh, pre-screen uh, patients. And so our, our members are being, are being a little bit more diligent and uh, more proactive in the PPE use. And I think a combination of all of that has resulted in less people off. So currently we're sitting with five people off as a result from the COVID. Uh, we've been up, uh, up close to 30 people off at one point. So we've seen dr uh, dramatic inc uh, increases and in improvements there. Um, two of those five, two of them are, are, are currently positive off uh, waiting that 
quarantine period at home resting with mild symptoms. Um, two of them have, um, two of them recently developed symptoms and just got their first test today. We'll see how that goes. And then we've had one that's been off for quite a while at home, just dealing with some mild respiratory symptoms and just trying to get over that last hurdle before coming back to work. Uh, all of that has allowed us to move into um, allowing some of our members that have spent a tremendous amount of time and effort and becoming qualified to go out uh, to assist the state on the wildland wildfire front in different positions uh, re that result from uh, th that, that run the gamut from um, line EMTs to base camp managers for incident management teams. The, uh, helicopter managers. I mean, there's a lot of different qualifications to get out there, and a lot of our members have done that. But due to staffing issues, we haven't been able to release some of them. But now we can, which is important because, um, and, you know, after speaking with Chief Mitchell, who's uh, had the privilege to uh, work in a deputy incident commander role on the second largest fire in the state history currently, the Santa Clara Unit Complex fire. Um, they mentioned that this is historic and catastrophic conditions ever seen in the state of California when it comes to fire. When they start using terms of historic and catastrophic, you know, that, that I mean, it's pretty easy to see when you watch the news. So when we had that lightning siege happen about two weeks ago, um, it lit off the state. And um, really what we are is we're in a resource deficient uh, stage. And so the tactics used to fight these fires used to be more of a direct attack. Um, we're having to actually expand a box and burn more acreage just to because we don't have the resources. So I'm happy to report that we're going to be able to send some more resources out. Uh, it's not going to be a lot. We're going to be monitoring it very closely because, again, our priority is, um, again, our area. We have to make sure we're, we're supporting that. We also want to be good partners with the state and help where we can. So that's the good news. Currently, as it sits, we've had um, strike teams sent out to the North Complex Fire, which sits to the northeast of Chico. Um, Susanville, some of you are familiar with that, and Quincy, that's part of that North Complex Fire. Our OES engines, our Type 1 engines are on that one. So we have two engine companies, so eight members are on that fire. Um, the other members of that strike team make up or consist, or make up from Sacramento Fire Department, Kasunas Fire Department, and Roseville Fire Department. And then we move over to our Type 3 strike team, our green OES engines. And we happen to have two on that one as well, and a strike team leader and a strike team leader trainee. Our two, um, they're on the LNU complex. So they're you're familiar with the Hennessy, the fires burning just north of Vacaville. Um, that is actually the third largest fire in state history, right behind the Santa Clara unit complex fire. So uh, they've been getting a lot of work. Um, crews are doing well. Um, everybody's healthy. I'm happy to report there. And we will be actually swapping them out because they, um, we have an agreement with um, OES to keep our members out for a period of 14 working days with an ability to transport on the first, or to, you know, crew rotations on the first, you know, on the end of that period. So they could extend out to 16 days by the time, they, time they leave and the time they come back. So this weekend will be crew rotation time. So we'll be sending fresh crews so they can come back and meet their families again reunite, get some rest, breathe some fresh air. Um, so that's all good stuff. And lastly, to report, we did send, um, the state was so deficient in resources, they actually had a large fire break out at the Tuolumne Calaveras unit, uh, about an hour, a little over an hour southeast of here. And there was no incident management teams to ha put on that fire. So our type three incident management team made out of Sacramento, which we have several members a part of, along with um, Cal Fire and to consume this Folsom Sacramento Fire Department. They took uh, that leadership role on over to that and ran that incident for the last five or six days. Um, so I'm happy to report that they did a fantastic job. We're hearing from the unit chief um, that they were very impressed with the, uh, the ability and skills that um, our members on the Type 3 team from Sacramento were able to show and demonstrate. So that fire is getting under control. The weather is uh, favorable for everybody. And most of these fires currently are taking advantage of that weather and um, making some progress. So that's the end of my report. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions or any questions? All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Moving on to firefighters, local 522. Looks like we have Joel Roberts in for Captain McGoldrick. 
Good evening, everyone. Director Joel Roberts, Local 522. Thanks for having me on tonight. I um, wanted to start off tonight by congratulating the uh, five directors that are running unopposed. Um, so congratulations on your next terms. We appreciate uh, those of you that met with us, Director Sheets, Director Jones, Director Wood, and Director White. Um, it's always good to have uh, sit down, have the conversation, uh, get your perspective on things, and also provide ours. So uh, we appreciate those me meetings a great deal. Uh, wanted to say a big thanks to Jeff Fry, um, also Eric Castleberry, Deputy Chief Shannon, and Jeff Malinowski on all their hard work at Station 68, uh, pr the planning process. Um, we know that in the end, that's going to be a good fit for the area and a good fit for our members. And uh, we appreciate all the uh, safety-minded upgrades that we're doing in there, um, isolating turnouts, things like that. We all know the, the epidemic of cancer in the fire service and uh, we appreciate everything that the district's doing to protect our members there. Um, and also as uh, Chief Bridge just mentioned, we have 22 members out on uh, out of county assignments right now. Um, so we appreciate their hard work and uh, hopefully those relief crews will be out um, this weekend and that everyone makes it home safe, happy, and healthy. So unless there's any questions, that I, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, moving on to committee and delegate reports. Uh, the executive committee, we have not met for some time and we do not have a scheduled meeting. So move on to communication center JPA, uh, uh, Chief Shannon. Good evening. Uh, thanks, President Sheets. Just a couple of uh, comments, just kind of dovetail on uh, uh, what Chief uh, Harms was starting with when involved in the comm center. Uh, they talked about an academy, an academy 20 2 was going well. Started uh, with six, actually five. They're down, they have lost one, they're down to four. Uh, they're starting week four next week, um, doing very well. Everybody's completed what's called their EMD training, which is a pretty much a really major hurdle in this academy. So uh, all expected to, to see the four of them, you know, in the, in the next four weeks. So that's going uh, very well. And uh, congratulations, uh, they're, they're, they're moving some folks. People are getting some opportunities for promotion. Uh, Lisa Smelzer has been uh, uh, promoted from dispatch to dispatch supervisor. So that's, that's moving well. And just kind of final piece, just really kind of a shout out to, um, to Chief Wagaman. Uh, you know, he took over over there about eight months ago or so. And uh, I was really moving that, uh, that the comp center forward. Um, I would love to get Chief Wagaman, if I can, in front of the board at some point down the road to um, give you a, kind of a big overview of what's going on with, with that comp center. Um, so with that, that's uh, in my report for the comp center. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions, comments? All right, moving on to California Fire Rescue Training JPA. Chief Shannon again. Good evening again, California Fire Rescue Training, JPA. Uh, there is no report. We haven't met for some time. We will meet again uh, September 17th uh, at four o'clock in Gold Canal and a report. Thank you, sir. All right, moving on to the Finance and Audit Committee, Director Rosali. Thank you. Finance and Audit Committee met um, earlier this, uh, this evening. We had two excellent reports from uh, CFO Thomas, and she announced that we have uh, reached that uh, position of having a 15% reserve, which is a phenomenal goal. And it's been a long haul, and I congratulate everyone who was involved. Uh, our next uh, meeting is to be determined, and I have no further information. Thank you, sir. Uh, I will report out for Director Gould for the Policy Committee. There is nothing to report. We'll move on to uh, board member questions and comments. We'll start with Director White. I just want to uh, thank uh, Director Joel Roberts for his uh, report and for reaching out to the uh, members of the board to have a discussion with them. And I just want to commend the labor management relationship that continues to exist at Metro Fire. And a report. Thank you, sir. Uh, Director Jones. Thank you, Madam President. These last couple of weeks, we and accumulate, accumulate, accumulating in tonight's uh, 
are culminating in tonight's meeting, we have reached some real milestones. As Director Rosali mentioned, in terms of our uh, finance finances, in terms of the long-awaited Station 68, in terms of setting up for success our emergency medical services, a lot of very, very large projects, processes that have been ongoing for years are, are starting to come to fruition. And I need to just say a great thank you for the heavy lift, uh, all the work that staff and members throughout our department have done. And that includes carrying this heavy burden of responding to fire emergencies throughout the state as well as all the medical emergencies compounded with COVID. So this, uh, everyone's doing a huge amount of lifting. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right, moving on, uh, Director Clark. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I would like to, uh, <laughs> the other, uh, some of the other thoughts I have been said, but I really, truly want to thank the men and women of, of Metro Fire. We have been challenged. I don't know what else we could, we, we could come mm -hmm. at us. Uh, it's, it's, the only thing left is a tornado, and I keep looking up in the sky sometimes to see if the locusts are, are coming because it's just been, a, it's been very challenging with all the COVID and the, and, uh, the wildfires and all that. And the guys are, you know, they're truly stressed out. And um, I thank them. I don't think it's, uh, it goes unnoticed at all the hard work that, uh, that the men and women of Metro Fire are doing. So uh, once again, just, all I can do is heartfelt thanks. You, That's sir. all I have, Madam Chair. I'm moving on, Director Wood. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's already been said. I couldn't say it any better than what Delman just said, so I'll echo those comments. And I, I just want to add also, uh, uh, Mr. Robert, Director Roberts, thank you so much for the time you and uh, Captain McGoldrick, uh, you guys took to meet with us. It was good to have those conversations, and uh, it's essential that we have those conversations. So I appreciate the time you guys took out of your days. Thank you, and stay safe. All right, Director Orzali. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to express my appreciation to uh, the mayor and uh, his staff for Citrus Heights. We uh, participated in the two by two. I think those are um, very important to maintain the sense of collaboration and uh, solidarity of, of purpose. We discussed in there uh, developmental plans for uh, Sunrise Mall and uh, called Sunrise Tomorrow. And I just appreciated everyone's input to it. I also want to thank uh, Jeff Fry for his work in bringing this report together this evening. Uh, uh, very well done, as, as is everything Jeff does. With that, I have no further report. Thank you. Uh, there is no comment from Director Gould, so we'll move on to Director Sailors. I would just like to thank everyone for their presentations tonight, um, especially Krishina um, from CRRD. Um, that was very good, and I, I'm just so happy that they were able to, um, as Director Jones said, um, still continue to get to the children in this these crazy times that we have with COVID. Um, that was very creative. Um, and I would just like everyone to stay safe out there, use your PPE, stay hydrated in these you know, hot days. And, and um, thank you everyone for still coming to work and doing your jobs um, as devoted to duty as everyone is. And thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, Director Kelly. I would, uh, the sentiments that Director Sailors just made are perfect for me. And I would just like to offer my uh, uh, appreciation to everybody that's associated with Metro Fire and the work that we all do to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the organization stays uh, at the top of its, of its uh, field. So uh, with that said, I will allow uh, you guys to carry on with me. Thank you very much. You guys have a good night. 
All right, going last is never fun, but I just did uh, also want to thank uh, everyone for their presentation items. Thoughts and prayers to the crews that are deployed and those uh, that are protecting our community here and picking up the phone uh, to, to help keep all those stations um, going uh, during this unbelievable time. And with that, um, our meeting will be adjourned. Our next board meeting will be September 10th and anticipated agenda items to follow. Hope everybody has a good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye, you too. Be safe.